And the term was gringo gigante, right? Which Brian told me I should write that so you can see, right? So large white guy. That's basically what my nickname was down in Guatemala City. And so we're playing and we're goofing around and we're having fun. But something I've done with kids for as long as I can remember is I do like a fist bump and then like an explosion. You guys, have you seen that? Right? I call it boom, right? There's not a lot to it, right? It's like cross-cultural. It's like, it seems like it should communicate, you know, fist pump. Boom, we move on. Well, their eyes got big, and I was like, oh, they love this. Like, this is awesome. So I, I'm doing it to them and doing it to them and doing it to them. We had like five different teams that we were all a part of. And so my team, I did it to my team probably five times each. I mean, just kept doing it over and over and over. Uh, well, here's what I found out at dinner the next day. It doesn't mean boom in Guatemala. It doesn't mean boom. In, in fact, uh, what our leader Jose told us is he said, David, there's like the middle finger in Guatemala and then there's what you did. <laughs> I said, really? And he goes, yeah, it basically means blank you and your mom. <laughs> and he said, I about died when you did it to some of their moms. I went, well, I will be keeping my hands in my pockets for the duration of our Guatemala trip since I single-handedly offended the entire village of the next generation that we just sang about, and their children, and their children, and their children, <laughs> and all God's children. You ever find it difficult to communicate something in a different language, a different culture? It would be so much easier to never try. So much easier just to stay where you're at, not say a word, keep your hands in your pockets. Man, I, I just pictured the, the translation that Jose, you know, our, our leader was saying, like, I know, and he's an American pastor, you know? <laughs> How disappointing. As we're talking about baptism today, as we're talking about the gospel, good news for the nations, Matthew 28 is what sticks out to me. It starts off like this, Matthew 28. Then Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all, say it with me, of all nations. And then baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The gospel that Jesus has preserved for us as the church today has always been meant to cross borders. It's always been meant to cross nations. I mean, in fact, to be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ means we are going to be taking that gospel across nations, across languages, across spiritual borders, across cultural borders, across every border known to man. The gospel penetrates all borders. It's been the purpose and the intent since the very beginning. Even in Genesis, God spoke to Abraham and he said, I, I'm going to create a people out of you and you will be a blessing to all of the world. I'm going to bless the world through you. The gospel at its core is good news for the nations. You can imagine frustration that maybe Jesus had when he was talking to the religious leaders of his time. When they said, Jesus, prove to us that you are the Messiah. Prove to us you're the savior of the world. Prove to us that you're the son of God. Give us a sign. And Jesus, his response to them uh, was actually quoting or referencing a passage of scripture that many of you have probably heard about before, but maybe not even studied in a, in a context like this here at church. Jesus says, you want a sign? I'll give you a sign. Uh, the sign of Jonah. That's my sign to you. You would know if you saw me, that I was the king or the king of the world, the son of God, you would know that I am him based on the sign of Jonah that I already gave you in the Old Testament. So I wanted to take you back. I wanted to read through some parts of Jonah to illustrate and to get after what Jesus was trying to communicate to the religious leaders of his time, to the, to the Jews of the time, to this movement that Jesus started called Christianity. I want to point to you what Jesus was actually getting after with Jonah. So Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, it says this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh. Side note, Jonah did not think the city of Nineveh was great. Jonah hated it. He hated the Ninevites because they were a brutal people. They were a wicked people. The, the feud and the division between the Ninevites and Jonah's people, I mean, it was deep, so deep. There was a hatred that fueled over and over and over. But God said, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. 
He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. So a lot of us don't know where these places are. This doesn't mean a lot. You see Tarshish. You're like, is that tartar sauce? Nope. Tarshish is a totally different city, but let me show you a map, right? Here's Joppa. This is where Jonah was. God said, I want you to go to Nineveh. And Jonah said, no, thank you. I'll buy a bus ticket. I'm leaving. See you later. So he gets on a ship, he takes off, he runs for his life from the Lord going, and this is funny, think about this. Jonah, I would rather see my enemies suffer and die than go to preach a message that might give them the possibility of being saved. That's how much he hated Nineveh. That's how much he didn't care. That's how much he was content with the divide. And yet I want you to see God's heart for the nations here. I want you to see his heart for going after people, for going through and over and overcoming every single border known to man to go after a people that was wicked and far from him because of God's overwhelming love for them. Verse 13, it keeps going on like this. Uh, so they encounter a storm. The storm gets so bad that Jonah and his men are, are wondering, like, are, are we going to survive this storm? So, so Jonah says, throw me over. That's what will stop the storm. And it says this. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Don't hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and they threw him overboard and the raging sea grew calm. I mean, you can imagine the scene, right? Like everybody's freaking out. They're throwing stuff overboard. And then all of a sudden they throw Jonah overboard and everything goes back to normal. You start wondering who in the world was this guy? At this, the men greatly feared the Lord. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now, the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. What an opportunity for reflection. (laughs) You know, what was that like? What is he thinking through? What I want you to catch, I mean, even just where we're at in this story with Jonah or with Nineveh, I, I want you to hear not just the heart that God has for the nations, but the heart that God has for Jonah to share his heart for the nations. It would have been very easy for God to go, and Jonah is no more. We wouldn't read about him. We wouldn't know his story. He'd be chalked up to another person that God said, this is what I want you to do. They said no, and then they disappeared. But God's desire To reach the people of Nineveh, it's the exact same heart of God to reach people like us today. It's his desire. He looks at us and he sees the wickedness. He sees the brokenness. He sees the pain. He sees the sin. He sees the division and the barriers. He sees all of it. And therefore, what he does is he takes his people, his followers, his children, and he invites them on the journey to bring his gospel, which just means good news, to bring his gospel to them. Because God's not sitting up in heaven waiting to destroy. He's not waiting to throw a lightning bolt. He's not waiting to rain sulfur down from heaven. God's desire as he sits in heaven, as he, as he looks at our world, is to bring healing and hope and restoration and peace to the places that are broken, to the places that write him off, to the, pra- to the places that turn their backs on him. And what God is doing with us as a church is inviting us to be a part of that rescue mission, to go after the lost, to go after the broken, to go after the disappointed and the estranged so that God can restore that which is broken. So why today are we doing Orphan Sunday and baptism. The reason we're doing Orphan Sunday and baptism is this, because God is still calling Jonah's to the nations. You know, Janith mentioned the number of orphans that exist uh, in our world today. Let's talk about the nations too. Right now, there's 195 countries in the world. With 195 countries, there's 7,100 different languages. There's 17,428 different people groups that currently exist today. Many of them are unreached with the gospel altogether. 
If we talk Orphan Sunday, I mean, Janice said there's 150 million orphans all over the world. In Kent County, there's 10,000, uh, or in Michigan, excuse me, in Michigan, there's 10,000 kids in foster care. Many of them are from the nations. Many of them are from different countries or different parts of the world. Many of them are from our own backyard, from our own families or our own friendships or the people who live in our neighborhoods. Right now, I, I saw this list too. There's 200, uh, there's 200 children right now that are waiting for adoption in our county. 200. The, the reason we've married Orphan Sunday and Baptism Sunday is it's, it's the same message. We were all orphaned before a relationship with Jesus. We were all vulnerable. We were all alone. We were all lost, kind of meandering through whether it's life or figuring out purpose or trying to deal with the brokenness or the sin or the pain or the separation that we have with God. And then because God in his goodness and his grace sends Jesus to go after us, he, he went after the orphan just like he went after the nation. It doesn't matter what barrier or what boundary existed, God was so set on overcoming every single one of them so that you and I might be able to step into the body and the community of faith. So God wants to see the nations saved. The question we have to wrestle with is, do we want the exact same thing? Do we want the same thing? Or have some of us maybe allowed what's going on in the world or what's going on in other nations or what's going on in, in just the brokenness of the day and age that we live in, have some of us just allowed that to, to maybe we just take a step back? We said, it doesn't really matter if I have a heart for the nations or not. It doesn't matter if I'm a part of visiting other cultures and nations or learning other languages or furthering the gospel in these places. Even like Janith talked about with Ukro. Ukro is so special to our church's history. It's in Ethiopia. It is a partnership that just Frontline has with a very specific village in Ukro, Ethiopia. And so when we sponsor a child, we, it, it's not just about money, but money opens doors. Money creates opportunities for education. Money creates opportunities for clean water, which is, has been established even in their community because of the giving here at Frontline over the last few years. But, but it also opens the door. When you have other physical needs that are met, you, the door then becomes open for you to meet some spiritual needs that exist in the community. You know, we're we're going to do a trip this coming year in 2023 out to Ukro, Ethiopia. If you have a sponsor child or if you want to see how some of your dollars are at work making a difference in the world, you could go. You could be a part of that. But what we learned even on Guatemala, and I, I've been to, I think, six or seven different countries around the world. What, what I learn every time is the nations don't need our money. They really don't. If that's a, a sticking point for you, you go, I don't want to do that. This is a pitch, whatever. It's, it's not. What, what the nations need, what people need is your relationship. They need your heart. You know, God didn't call Jonah and he, he didn't say, write a, write a check and send it over to Nineveh because that's all they need. He said, no, no, I, I'm sending you to Nineveh. I want you to be there. I want you to look them in the eyes. I want you to meet them as people. I want you to see them the way that I see them. God's heart for the nations and his heart for the church today is to do the exact same thing. He, he wants his heart, his burden, his pains for people that are far from him, both abroad and local. God wants his heart for them to also be your heart. That's his deep desire. Without a mandate for the nations, we miss the gospel entirely. Hey, thanks for watching this video. We hope you enjoyed it. Hope it made an impact on your life somehow. And if it did, don't forget to like or subscribe or share it on social media with your friends as well. Uh, we always love seeing you. And remember that you can join us live every single Sunday. So hope to see you there.